Let's continue. At the beginning of chapter 48, the priest agrees with the canon and alludes to Homer and Virgil, the two princes of Greek and Latin poetry. Then, as if his change of mind at the end of the previous chapter were not surprising enough, the canon makes a wildly suggestive confession. I have had a certain temptation to write a book of chivalry, and if I have to confess the truth, I've already written more than 100 folios. A hundred folios would be equivalent to having written up to the episode of the galley slaves in the novel we're reading. The canon even reports that he has shared his manuscript with intellectual as well as lay readers, and from all of them I have received friendly approval. Wow, the comparison with the two most important poets of classical antiquity, the temptation to perfect the books of chivalry, the idea of writing for both sophisticated and unlearned audiences, in this passage, Cervantes is clearly talking about his own experience of writing Don Quixote. Now the issue becomes even more complicated. The canon confesses that he had abandoned the project of the novel because despite the early approvals, he refuses to subject himself to the confused judgment of the mindless commoner, which would be the only way to make a living at writing and not end up poor by working for free as does the tailor on the corner. He tells how he reached this decision through an interior dialogue, an argument that I had with myself, reflecting on the decadent state of modern theater, which exhibits well-known nonsense and things out of which one can make neither heads nor tails. Note that the debate has now expanded to include another literary genre, which is also another autobiographical twist because Cervantes began his own literary career writing plays. Thus, when the canon relates a conversation that he had with an actor, among the few well-written plays mentioned is Cervantes' own tragedy, La Numantia. Also, this is the famous passage in which Cervantes seems to taunt rival author Lope de Vega, some critics believe that our novelist bitterly resented Lope. But this chapter's literary problems also manifest Cervantes' playful Baroque aesthetics. First, the canon cites Lope's Ingratitude Avenged as another example of a well-written play. Second, the priest replies that comedies that evade the aforementioned precepts have awakened in him an old rancor akin to his complaints against the books of chivalry. In other words, both theater and the novel have their problems. Third, the priest objects to the commercialization of the theater. Since comedies have become saleable goods, they say, and they say correctly, that actors won't buy them if they are not written in that way. In other words, the priest, a character in the greatest bestseller of all times, accuses Lope, a man whom he admits is a most fertile wit of these kingdoms, of wanting to make money. Fourth, and most problematic of all, the priest proposes state censorship as the solution to the decadent status of modern comedies because their performance now depends too heavily on the use and abuse of pyrotechnics or the animations, as they call them, which cause astonishment in ignorant people and thus attract them to the comedies. And all of this is to the detriment of their capacity for truth. At the end of his harangue, the priest alleges that it would not be a sufficient justification to simply say that comedies function to entertain the community with some wholesome recreation, and that the perpetrators deserve punishment for having performed acts to the detriment of certain kings and to the dishonor of certain lineages. Ironic contradictions abound in this last assertion. The priest despises technical innovation, but Cervantes himself boasted of violating Aristotelian precepts by being the first to portray allegorical figures on the modern stage. Moreover, Cervantes wrote two famous works which criticized the immorality of kings and noble lineages, La Numancia, which condemned the tyranny of Philip II, and El Retablo de las Maravillas, which mocked the ethnocentric pride of old Christians. Regarding the use of animations or special effects, Sancho has already noted that something similar has been employed to deceive Don Quixote. A great irony of this chapter lies in the fact that the illusion of the fantastic Mikomikon plot is managed 
by the same priest who now criticizes the lack of verisimilitude in modern theater. And there's another irony in the priest's doubts about the excuse that playwrights just want to entertain the community with some wholesome recreation, because Cervantes himself repeatedly invokes entertainment to justify his novels. However, the most shocking aspect of the theoretical dialogue between the canon and the priest occurs when the latter proposes state censorship. All these problems would cease if there were at court an intelligent and discreet person who would examine all comedies before they were performed, not only those to be performed at court, but also those anyone wished to perform in Spain, without whose approval, stamp, and signature no local magistrate would allow any comedy to be staged. Could Cervantes possibly be speaking his own mind by the priest here? Notice that he does not stop there. And if someone else or the same person were charged with examining the books of chivalry, which are newly written, without a doubt, many could attain the perfection that your worship has said. What, like many tyrants, the priest may have good intentions, but he ends up proposing a kind of discretion, a wholesomeness, a cultural purity that is difficult to imagine, and he has done so near the conclusion of one of the most incoherent, irreverent, and impure novels of all time. Let's attend to the novelistic break, which now undermines the happy agreement between our two moralists regarding how to manage the Republic's comedies and novels. The first thing we notice is yet another locus amenus, a beautiful valley which opened up for them, where the group decides to rest and eat. At this point, Cervantes pays curious attention to the sumpter mule, el acemila del repuesto, which the canon observes should have already arrived at the end. The animal is mentioned twice more, and in the end, the canon orders its return. Take all the horses there and make the sumpter mule come back. If we consult a dictionary, an athemila is a mule that carries the food supplies of travelers, and it's an Arabic word, which in antiquity also meant a type of tribute or tax that was paid using these animals. In any case, there is a curious to and fro here. Once again, Cervantes seems to be using a mysterious pack animal to signal something unstable about his text. And just when the matter of the sumpter mule is cleared up, another instability arises, this time in Don Quixote's rectum. Sancho manages to speak to his master without the continued vigilance of the priest and the barber. And approaching the cage, he says, Lord, to relieve my own conscience, I would like to inform you regarding your enchantment. It's that these two over here with their faces covered are the priest of our village and the barber. Increasingly materialistic, Sancho insists again that Don Quixote is not enchanted, but foolish and tricked. In other words, deceived by the priest. Don Quixote responds as usual. What you have to understand and believe is that if they resemble them, as you say, it must be that those who have enchanted me have taken their appearance and likeness in order to allow you to think what you think and be drawn into a labyrinth of illusions. And I know on my own account that human forces, as long as they are not supernatural, are not enough to imprison me, so they are what you say they are as much as I am a Turk. Sancho persists, insinuating that Don Quixote has allowed himself to be deceived and interrogating his master in a logical and legalistic matter, putting a key question to him. As proof of what I say, I want to ask you one thing. And if you answer me as I think you have to answer me, you will have positive proof of this trick and will see that you are not enchanted, but lacking in common sense. I ask, speaking with all due respect, whether or not, ever since your worship has been caged and in your happy estimation enchanted in this cage, you have felt the need or urge to make major waters or minor waters, as they say. At first, Don Quixote doesn't understand, but when Sancho explains, material reality suddenly takes hold of him. Get me out of this predicament. There's something filthy about all this. 
So now, what do you think Cervantes thinks about the priests and the canon's plans to purify novels and plays?